Welcome back, Cannonites, for the first cannon fodder of 2017, and boy is it packed to the brim. This week in preparation for the Halo Wars 2 Blitz beta, we got a look at some of the art and descriptions for a few of the Blitz cards that will be available in the beta and the final game. Before we dive into those, however, I have the pleasure of exclusively revealing a card that has not yet been seen by the fanbase, unless you're already playing. The Guard Upgraded Warthog. Undoubtedly the most versatile vehicle in the UNSC inventory, the Warthog has been manufactured in one variant or another for centuries. This famously reliable vehicle boasts impressive speed, rugged suspension, and four-wheel steering, all of which have helped make it one of the UNSC's handiest land units. In response to a completely new battlefield problem presented by the Banished and their ruthlessly brutal arsenal, Isabel has assisted the crew of the Spirit of Fire in using available resources to create up-armored variants of the Warthog to deploy in particularly adverse circumstances. Damn, that turret guard is beastly! And as we'll see going forward with other descriptions of UNSC vehicles, we can confirm that a lot of the new and or upgraded vehicles that have been seen so far are like that for a reason, either recovered from abandoned UNSC bases or upgraded with Isabel's help, in some cases both. This is what a lot of us in the lore community kind of figured, but it's nice to get that confirmation. And again, before we get into the actual article, if you want more exclusive reveals, Hidden Xperia revealed the Atriox's Chosen card, and Covenant Cannon revealed the Sunghealy Honor Guard. Both shared the accompanying lore and provided some very interesting breakdowns. Links are on screen and in the description box, so I encourage you to check out both videos. Now onto the main article, where we start with the Banished Banshee. The earliest model of Banshees were fashioned after the Skeln, a leathery winged flying predator from the Sunghealy homeworld, Sunghelios. However, the Banished have since twisted the ancient ancestry to incorporate design details more closely related to an aerial predator hailing from their homeworld of Doisak. Many of the Banished in Atriox's fleet have been modified with brutal and experimental weaponry, usually designed to inflict maximum damage from both a physical and psychological perspective. It's more or less what you expect of a brute upgraded Banshee, built on the Sunghealy Foundation while making it their own. I'm really eager to see what sort of experimental weapons we might see on the Banshee, but that line alone actually explains some differences in weaponry seen on other vehicles, such as the Banished Locust. Next up is the Brute Warlord, which, as one can see, is a much more fierce version than the one we saw in the Halo Wars 2 beta from last June. Favored chieftains in Atriox's retinue have the unique opportunity to be promoted to the status of Warlord. Vicious agents positioned to intercede on the Banished leader's behalf to bring recalcitrant packs to heal and direct critical faction operations. Answerable only to Atriox and Decimus, Warlords are no doubt feared by lesser brutes and hated by Letvalir's troops, though none can deny the Warlord's loyalty or violent proficiency in culling the Banished ranks of weaker links. Indeed, many a prideful chieftain has forgotten who their work should be enriching and have wound up on the receiving end of a Warlord's personally fashioned gravity hammer. Here we see Atriox's Enforcer, and as expected, they look brutal. I think my favorite aspect of this is that Warlords wield their own custom gravity hammers. I can't wait for details on the green one pictured here and other ones we might see during the game. Next up is Basic Grunt Infantry. Ungoy may not always be strong, brave, intelligent, hygienic, or even particularly fearsome warriors, but those pledged to serve the Banished have a healthy enough fear of the Jirohane leaders to stay on task and motivated. Even if their fellows are used as target practice by bored brutes or disintegrated by forerunner sentinels, these seasoned survivors can at least look forward to a full food nipple and an occasional brief nap in the methane atmosphere they call home. And following that are suicide grunts. Truly aggressive and violent grunts are rare, but without covenant oversight or the environmental hazards of Balaho to cull them from the population, the number of aberrant ungoy has increased dramatically in thrall colonies. The Banished have adapted existing indoctrination protocols to turn the aggression and natural cleverness of these legions to their own violent purposes. I love that we're getting to see both varieties of Ungoy side by side in Halo Wars 2. With the classic design, we get the Grunt infantry we know from the games of old. The description actually reminds me of a line from the Arbiter about the Grunts in Halo 3. The Grunts' newfound courage is but fear. And then we have the new design used for the Suicide Squads. It's a small detail, but it's one that I absolutely love. Next up is the G81 Condor Heavy Gunship. The Vulture is still currently, officially, the heaviest standard air combat unit the UNSC has to offer, but rest assured there's nothing official about the Condor Gunship. This imposing flying fortress is actually a repurposed and highly weaponized civilian dropship. While the Condor gunship does break a large number of UNSC weapon platform regulations, its effectiveness in battle is truly undeniable. 
The G81 is a slow-moving but powerful craft armed with multiple pulse laser turrets and a light magnetic accelerator cannon, all of which are capable of independently targeting enemy units. The pulse lasers offer a high rate of fire, making the Condor effective against mass units, while the light mag provides devastating burst damage for hard target elimination. As some noticed during the first beta, while the default Pelican uses the classic D-77TC design, a Condor is what is used to bring in the main bases and it uses the D-79 chassis seen in the 343 games. Here we see one modified, in an unofficial manner, to utilize multiple Spartan laser attachments and a mini mag. I can't imagine what the kick must be like. Following that we have the new EV-44 Support VTOL or Nightingale. The EV-44 Nightingale is a dedicated support unit that uses its complement of multi-purpose restoration drones to repair allied units. Its relatively simple construction, aside from the advanced drone system, has made it possible to adapt the Nightingale's design blueprint to the Spirit of Fire's older factory models. The Nightingale has no offensive abilities, lacking even a basic weapon system. However, the craft is equipped with various countermeasures to survive harrowing battlefield situations, including the ability to deploy multi-spectrum smoke screens and disposable jammers capable of camouflaging all units within the target area. Up next is a classic, ODST units. Vigilant and Venerable, Orbital Drop Shock Troopers, ODSTs, are elite soldiers eager to deploy into even the most dangerous battlefield to make quick work of most opposing infantry units. Operating primarily as a Special Forces raiding unit of the Marines, ODSTs are deployed from the Spirit of Fire to tip the scales in close battle, raid enemy bases, capture strategically valuable points, and eliminate high-value targets. These heroes have spent nearly 30 decades cut off from their calling, and are more than eager to begin making up for lost time against the best that the Banished have to throw at them. Looking at the art, we can see the H-2A designs with some slight modifications to the armor, and ODSTs using post-war drop pods, all likely appropriated from abandoned UNSC bases. As a side note, I'd love to know the exact relationship between the H-2A and now HW-2 ODST armor, and the more iconic designs seen in Halo 3, ODST, and Reach. I theorized a while back that this is actually meant to be an early war design, as the versions seen in Halo 3 and later games are all noted as having been originally developed for Mjolnir and integrated with ODST armor later on. Next up is the G-77S Pelican gunship, a new vehicle. Building upon the versatile foundation of the venerable D-77 airframe, the G-77 Pelican is an impressive gunship design cooked up by Isabel and the Spirit of Fire's engineers to help turn the tide of battle against the banished forces on the Ark. The G-77S Pelican gunboat boasts a powerful range of armaments including top-mounted anvil missile pods, four payload hardpoints, a forward M370 chain gun turret, and multiple 12.7mm Vulcan cannons. After that we have the new UNSC Sniper. The Spirit of Fire's sniper teams have traditionally operated in the background, serving as the true unsung heroes of many skirmishes and aerial strikes. Drawn from the experienced Marine Force Reconnaissance and Army Cavalry Scouts, snipers are experts at monitoring enemy movement and detecting cloaked units. Among the impressive array of weapons at their disposal are signature suppressed anti-materiel rifles and the deadly Sachin portable rail cannon. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I love that we're seeing the Sachin in-game. The rifle first revealed in a bonus page of the Halo graphic novel, though this version is noticeably bulkier. The scout itself looks rather odd, almost robotic, especially with that helmet. I'm also curious how they cloak themselves. I'm sure it's recovered UNSC or Banish tech, maybe even Forerunner, but I'd like to know one way or the other. After that, we get what was probably my favorite entry on this list, Douglas 042, which I totally called, by the way. Hailing from an affluent family on the Asphodel colony, Douglas 042 had a tough time adjusting to the Spartan 2 program. However, after an initial bout of culture shock, his anger gave way to a quiet confidence. Even among other Spartans, Douglas is considered something of a giant, and he soon came to believe that he'd found a purpose in life. This faith in his destiny marks Douglas as an optimist by Spartan standards, and his hopefulness often lifts the spirits of his more cynical comrades. As core components of Mjolnir-powered assault armor cannot be replicated by the Spirit of Fire, the Spartans of Red Team will look to take advantage of Gen 2 parts recovered from UNSC outposts, ingenious reverse engineering solutions developed by Serena, and deft modifications made by Isabel to stay in the fight. The potential amalgamation of these changes and Red Team's original Mark IV armor could eventually allow for completely new design permutations customized to the needs of each Spartan. This was rather interesting. First, the notion that Douglas is considered a giant, he's only 2 inches taller than the Master Chief, 
shorter than Sam and about the same height as George. But of greater interest is his armor. Ever since seeing that red armor in the Halo Wars 2 beta menu, many fans have been speculating about who it could be. Here, we see Douglas in a mix of Mark IV and Gen 2 armor. Interestingly, the art here seems to have been inspired by a classic piece of Halo 3 art. Last, I'm sure some might be confused about the mention of Serena. Minor spoilers for a moment, so consider skipping ahead. As anyone who's read Tales from Slipspace knows, Serena is gone. She initiated Final Dispensation, leaving only messages and files behind. Among what she left behind could have been reverse engineering solutions. Most likely these were developed for Covenant or perhaps Forerunner tech, but they could be adapted by Isabel for Mjolnir. I saw a couple people confused over this, so I just wanted to address it. From there we get the final entry, the AV-14B Hornet. Hornets are versatile, fast attack aerial gunships used for combat reconnaissance and surprise attacks on high priority targets. They're armed with medium auto cannons that are effective against all targets and are particularly adept at taking out light vehicles. Typically, Hornets are comparatively fragile, relying primarily on their speed and versatility to make them a valuable tool in the field. However, the crew of the Spirit of Fire have also begun using a variety of modified Hornet chassis with unique attributes in an attempt to gain any competitive edge available against the Banished. And that does it for the Blitz cards. I loved this preview of what we can expect along with all the new lore that helps explain some of the changes in UNSC technology. Hopefully we'll see more of these as we get closer to the release of Halo Wars 2. I'd really love to hear the lore behind the new base look, assuming that's not in the game itself. And while that was certainly a load of new lore, we have some older lore, technically speaking, to follow it up as we discuss new figures for Halo Ground Command released over the holidays. First up is a Covenant Command pack which adds two elite commanders, notably the Officer from Halo Reach. Sangheili who advance in rank among the ground troops are seasoned and battle-hardened soldiers first, officers by human reckoning second. They lead by personal example, exhorting their comrades to press the attack from the front lines while displaying the martial qualities that the Sangheili perceive as invaluable for their commanders. Combat losses among these veterans are high, but there is also much honor to be won for family and clan while carrying out the Prophet's orders to exterminate humanity. The promise of honor and glory ensures that there is no shortage of Sangheili looking to prove their worth on the Great Journey's path. Sangheili that survive and temper their enthusiasm for violence are promoted to the host of obedientaries, taking on missions that require both cunning and courage in equal measure. The Sangheili term for these acolytes roughly translates as lesser chosen or charged with glory, but among humans they are known simply as officers or majors. I still want to know what the actual difference between a major and officer harness is though. I wonder if it has to do with specific fleets or perhaps certain covenant ministries. Next up we have Grunt Infantry. No large lore description, but there was an interesting bit of new lore. It's hard to pick out, but in this unit shot you can see Yamblim's nephew and fifth cousin. Yes, the Yamblim, who later went on to be a Thrall Taskmaster under the command of Decimus shortly before his fateful encounter with Alice 130 on the Ark. Needless to say, I was cracking up. After that we have Jekyll Infantry and Jekyll Marksmen. The Jekylls are a fractious species who serve the Covenant out of a well-developed sense of self-preservation and opportunism rather than any particular religious fervor. Were they to cooperate, the Kegyar could be a deadly threat to the Prophets, but blood feuds and other internal rivalries continue to undermine long-term gains. Nevertheless, while their matriarch's plot and scheme, Jekylls selected to fill the Prophets' endless tithes as foot soldiers, are always on the lookout for information and resources that could be of benefit to kith and kin once the Covenant's attention turns elsewhere. Jekyll is the human nickname for the diverse Kigyar species, who are often encountered in scouting and sniper roles among the Covenant ground forces. Loyal only to their families and matriarchs, the Kigyar serve the Covenant for their own ends, with service to the Great Journey a distant consideration. Those with a demonstrably superior dexterity and a controlled bloodlust are elevated from the ranks of shock infantry to serve as scout executors, ranging throughout the war zone to eliminate impediments to the war host's advance. These ruthless assassins have no rules of engagement, no laws of war they must adhere to, only targets of opportunity. Between these two paragraphs, this is probably one of the best descriptions for the nature of the species put to ink, so to speak. Also of interest, Grimm notes that some of the marksmen that honed their skills on Reach would go on to snipe marines on Earth. After that we get a UNSC Army Command Team, which features Spartan 3s. While the models in Ground Command aren't meant to be tied to any one group of Spartan 3s, the fact that they are red and that there was a Spartan 3 red team on Reach is rather suspect. 
Following that are infantry wielding MA-37s, shotguns, rocket launchers, and machine gun turrets. The weapons team that follows is very similar, but a few models also carry grenade launchers. And finally, we have the Army recon teams wielding DMRs, sniper rifles, and target locators. All UNSC snipers receive similar training and equipment, but their method of employment varies by service and unit. Army snipers are arranged into specialized reconnaissance units at the battalion level, and are scouts and forward observers first, snipers second. Though they provide valuable anti-infantry and anti-vehicle capabilities to the teams they work with, the recon unit's primary job is defined as augmenting the main strategic effort of their task force by placing sensors and extending the UNSC battle net into enemy territory. It's pretty cool that sniper units actually differ between branches like this, it adds a real layer of depth to the UNSC as whole. What really caught my eye though, were the target locators on some models. I'm guessing that they can also be used for spotting, not just calling in orbital strikes. And that wraps it up for the main article. We close with, first, a video tour of 343's Halo Museum. This was first aired during the 15th anniversary livestream, but now you can watch it in its entirety on YouTube. It's absolutely worth it, and I say that as someone who's actually been there. Next is a shout out to the website Forward Unto Dawn. A little while back, they released a very interesting analysis of the Prophet of Truth, his history, his character, and his motivations. It's a great read, no matter your knowledge level. Finally, much to my surprise, Grim linked to my History of Red Team video. If you want to get ready for Halo Wars 2, I'm constructing a primer series, much like I did with Halo 5, the second episode of which is about Red Team, the first about the Spirit of Fire. Keep an eye out as there are plenty more to come. And that does it for now. The Blitz beta is live for some and goes live for everyone tomorrow. I've left a link to the FAQ thread below if you have any questions about it. And speaking of the beta, I'll be live streaming some Blitz tomorrow at a yet undecided time. Thanks for watching as always, and I hope to see you all on the battlefield. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.